Lamont is going to be telling us about a novel method for the preparation of intermediate membranes. Um, this slide is about silicon carbide membranes for gas separation applications. Uh, I'm talking about how we prepare the membranes, how we characterize them, and then finally how we improve their performance and I introduce a new method for fabricating the silicon carbide membranes. In recent years, there has been interesting interest, uh, uh, interest to, to make high hydrogen pair selective membranes which can uh, function at high temperatures and also they are stable at high temperatures. Because there are lots of applications for such membranes, for example, the products of cold gasification that has lots of hydrogen and you want to adjust the ratio of hydro hydrogen to CO or any other mixture that you have hydrogen. In it. And in long term, you can use such membranes for membrane reactors. For, it, for instance, this is the single most important reaction for producing syngas for hydrogen. If you have a hydrogen perm selective membrane, you can take out hydrogen from one side and push the reaction in the forward direction. In this way, you can overcome the equilibrium conversion and it, have, it can have higher conversion. And not only that, if you have a membrane that can work at high temperatures, you can have the advantage of in situ separation of hydrogen. So at the end, you don't need to separate the mixture. It is in situ, so you have a high, uh, pure hydrogen. So the goal is to make membranes that are hydrogen selective, hydrogen perm selective, and are stable at high temperatures. Researchers have used different kind of materials like silica, but silica is not very stable because of reaction of silica, I mean silicon oxygen bond with water or hydrolysis, the pores will be clogged when you expose the silica to steam. And zeolite is the same thing. Palladium membranes are very hydrogen curve selective, but they are expensive and because of the irreversible reactions, with, for example, sulfur, the property of membrane will be changed. And the other membranes are carbon molecular seed. They are very inexpensive membranes, but the problem is that you cannot use them in oxidizing environment because of oxidation. So our candidate is silicon carbide. Why silicon carbide? Because of its many unique properties like hydrogen, high chemical <coughs> stability, high thermal conductivity, low thermal expansion that leads to high thermal shock resistance and high temperature resistance for abrasion. These are the kind of properties that we need to have in high quality for membrane application. So for preparing silicon carbide membranes at low temperatures, you have two common rules. One is CBT, or chemical vapor deposition, and the other is pyrolysis of a few ceramic polymer. The method that I used is the second one. <coughs> My colleague is working on the first one. The polymer that we used is AHPCS, that stands for Allylhydrogen Polypyrrocylane. This is the only single component polymer that can be converted to silicon carbide at low temperatures and gives you a high, uh, I mean, the silicon carbide carbon ratio of close to one. And other polypropylene need for cross-linking, you need to add uh, some catalysts or cure them in oxygen environment. Then you expose the polypropylene in oxygen, so you have forming silicon and oxygen or silica uh, compounds which are. Uh, not good uh, for steam containing environment as a fact. So this material can be converted to silicon carbide without introducing any oxygen. Actually, we prepared our supports just by uh, appropriate amount of silicon carbide powders, resin, brown carbide, and aid, and we just made press them with our homemade design guide, and then we sintered them at a very high temperature of 1,800 degrees. In order to ca characterize such support, we just <coughs> measured the 
reciprocity of the support, which is 30% with Archimedes method. And if you assume that you have just uh, viscous flow and Nielsen flow, you can come up with average pore size and also with tortuosity of the support. The average pore size that we obtain for just this support is 130 nanometers, but for the range of support that we make is between 130 nanometers to around 200 nanometers. So the pore size of the support is around in this range, 100 to 200 nanometers. In the past, for pre-training membrane, we just used a uh, deep coding technique. But we were not very successful to produce high performance membrane. And the reason was that because of the technique that we used for preparing supports, the pore size distribution was not good. It was just pressing of the tubes. So the quality of the support was not good. So if the quality of the support is not good, then you have defect. And when you prepare membrane, you have defect propagation into a structure of the membrane, so you don't have high uh, performance membrane. Actually, what we did, uh, what we did to overcome this problem, we prepared uh, a stick casting solution. We just mixing our dead coding solution in silicon carbide powders, and our, according to our SCM, these powders have a range of size between 100 to 200 nanometers, which is within the range of the this particle size is the, within the range of the pore size of our support. We hope that using this slip casting as a first layer, these particles go and sit on the top of the pores and partially close them, and you don't uh, have any defects and its propagation into the structure. After first layer slip casting, we parallelize the structure at 750 degrees C, and then we decoded the first layer slip casted support in our depth coding solution for additional time, and in between, we finalized the structure at 750 degrees C. This is the cross section, a same cross section of one of our membrane. As you see, the thickness of the membrane is almost two micrometers. And our x ring shows that the membrane is amorphous. This is the performance of one of our membranes. As you see, with increasing the temperature, the permeance of hydrogen increases. So you have an active transport for hydrogen. But for a large molecule, molecule like argon, with increasing the, the temperature, the permeation goes down. So for example, at 200 degrees C, you have a separation factor of 54 for hydrogen over argon. With separation factor, we mean just the ratio of the permeance of <coughs> hydrogen over argon in this case. But if you increase the temperature, because of the active transport, hydrogen permeance goes up. And also, <coughs> argon permeance goes down. So you should have a higher, much higher separation factor of high temperatures and also higher permeance for hydrogen. This is the range of permeance and separation factors that we obtain for some of our membranes. As you see, the single gas separation factor of hydrogen over methane is something that is very to 80 and for CO2 is 40 to 90. It's good actually this separation factor, but the permeance is low. It's a matter of 10 to the power minus 9. So we made our membranes. This is the first step. But before going further, we should make sure that the membranes are esteem stable because if they are not, so there is no use for such membranes. So we did uh, a steam stability test on our membrane. We exposed our membrane for 14 days to 200 degrees C of uh, steam. About, uh, actually, it was a mixture of helium and steam. And we checked the behavior of the membrane. As you see, the permeance of the helium just shows a small decline, but after some time it stabilizes. For argon case, the permeance is constant. So in terms of separation factor, we start with a separation factor of hydrogen helium over argon 34, but after 14 days exposure, you have something like 24. So with this long time exposure, still you have a microporous membrane, so your membrane is stable. But we need to further improve the membrane 
performance by improving the mean that increasing the hydrogen per, uh, permeance and also hydrogen for, for example, other gases separation factor. This is a concept that we suggested. If this is our support, we just uh, do a stick casting as a first layer because we learned that this first layer of stick casting improved the success rate of making membranes. And then we just coated the whole structure in polyacetylene. And then we dry it at 100 degrees C in order to have it in place. And then we coated the whole structure in our pre ceramic polymer. The reason that we used hexane as a solvent for our pre ceramic polymer was because of the fact that polyacetylene is not soluble in hexane. So during the deep coating or afterward, we make sure that polyacetylene sits in place. And why we use this sacrificial layer, I mean polyacetylene, is because of the fact just we wanted to protect the pores against the infiltration of our, of our polymer inside the pores. If we protect the pores, so we have a higher active surface area. And not only that, researcher have shown that polyacetylene during pyrolysis releases some gases like styrene and methane that helps to have a three-dimensional structure for membrane or, in other words, have a high permeance for hydrogen. So then we uh, pyrolyze the whole structure at uh, 750. But from here to here, complex phenomena happen. For example, polyacetylene has a melting point of around 240 degrees C, and uh, it, the composition starts from 340 degrees C. And also, the cross-linking of a polymer happens in the same range of temperatures. So we need to do more research on what's happening. In order to see what, how polyacetylene behaves, before coating the last layer of our pre-ceramic polymer, we did coat the full structure in polyacetylene to see whether polyacetylene sits on the top or not. But as you see, we cannot see any polyacetylene on the top, meaning that within the resolution of our SCM, the polyacetylene is not distinguishable, it should be very thin, or it can be fused inside the pores. But the point is, the membrane that we prepared with this technique has a thickness of around 7 micrometers, which is much higher than 2 micrometers that we prepared with our conventional technique. Although the thickness is larger, but we see that the performance of such membranes are higher. For example, this is the range of permeances and separation factors that we got. Compared to what we got in the past, we have a two to four times improvement in hydrogen permeance. And not only that, the separation factor goes one order of magnitude higher. So the technique is working. Uh, at this point, in the, uh, we learned that if we use <coughs> just powder, silicon carbon powder, as uh, the filler for our membrane preparation, because these silicon carbides are non-porous, then you lose some of the active surface area. For example, the gas hydrogen comes here, and you cannot go through this. So you should go to the pathway like this. So using this, you lose some of your surface, active surface area. And not only that, you have a more porous membrane. So your permeance goes down. The idea that we have at this point is using the porous nanotubes that gives you the flexi flexibility of not only preventing uh, defect formation like this, but also because, for example, it's porous on the walls, hydrogen can diffuse inside the pores. So you have actually the whole surface area active. And not only that, you have less torches membrane. <coughs> For doing so, at this point, we use the uh, template. And we successfully prepared these silicon carbide nanotubes in a hope that we just use them as a new filler to increase the permeance and separation factor of our templates. In conclusion, we learned that first layer of slip testing improves our membrane in terms of success rate of making high performance membrane and also enhancing the membrane 
performance itself. And silicon carbide membranes are pretty much stable in the same condition that we use. And the cyclical <coughs> layer that we propose is working and we suggest it for application to other inorganic membranes. Thank you very much for your attention.